Chapter Eleven of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. As the years passed, the Curie of Ours became still more active in helping missions and charitable projects, anything and everything which would spread knowledge of God and of His love. The generosity and lack of self interest which long ago had deprived him of his first new suit in Eccoli often impelled him now to give away money which he should have saved for his personal use. Pilgrims coming to Ars often brought substantial gifts of money to the Curie, money which he seldom held on to long enough to pay his debts. One day, when he found himself especially pressed for cash, although he had received a good deal in the course of the week, he worked out a plan which he hoped would protect him from himself. He called to him a Mrs. Renard, who helped around the church and made herself useful in straightening out his tangled finances. Claudine, he told her, I want you to take on a new duty. I will be very glad to, Father, if you think I can do whatever it is. You can. All you need to do is to be very strict. Each day, the curie went on, I'll empty my pockets and you will take charge of whatever comes out. You are to take good care of the money. And, above all, be on your guard against the curie of ours. If he comes asking for any of it, refuse him point blank. Every day from that time on, the curie would give all the cash she had to Mrs. Renard, who promptly put it in a strong box. So obedient was she to his directions, that its inaccessibility often chagrined the curie, when he was unable to give to a person or a charity which appealed to him. Self-denial, of course, was the stuff of which Father Vianney's life was made, and had been for many years. He had long ago imposed on himself the rule never to smell a flower, never to drink when particularly thirsty, never to brush away a fly, never to express disgust at any unpleasant sight or smell, never to complain of discomfort. All his life, even as a boy, he had disliked and suffered from the cold. Yet as a man he refused to do anything to protect himself from it. Once when, after sitting for hours in the confessional, he started to leave, he fell heavily to the floor. Both feet had become numb and dead with the cold. When his distressed parishioners picked him up and would have called a doctor, he held up his thin hand to stop them. I don't need a doctor, he twinkled. All I need is a little more caution. After this, on cold days, I'll touch my feet and be sure they are there before I try to walk on them. Privately, he told his assistant that night, I have what I asked for. Long ago, I promised God that, if he would let me convert ours, I'd never complain of any suffering he might send me. The assistant priest remained silent for some time, pondering the strange gentle man, whose speech was often stumbling and ungrammatical, but who spoke always with such wisdom and assurance that people now flocked from all France, indeed from all Europe, to listen to him. Who was your master in theology? the young priest finally asked. I had the same master as St. Peter, replied the curie simply. There was another pause. The assistant heard the answer, but it was so frank and childlike that it was hard to understand. Yet, now that he and Father Vianney had a few moments together, he wanted to learn more of what made the curie so great, and, if he could, to adopt some of his way of life. How do you manage to do so much for God? he asked. Please, don't, please don't speak that way. I do nothing, and God does so much for me. But this I have learned, and I learned it from the shepherds who are in the fields in the winter time. They build a fire and draw near it for warmth. But from time to time they run about collecting wood to keep the blaze alive. Like them, we must learn how to keep the fire of the love of God alive in our hearts. We must feed the flame with prayer and good works. The curie stopped speaking. It was plain that he was very tired. The wonder was that he was still alive. A man near seventy, who still spent twelve or fourteen hours a day in the confessional, a man who had passed decades of his life in physical rigors and spiritual battles, enduring at the same time unequal persecution from Satan himself. Nor, with increase of years, was there any let-up in the demands upon him. Rather, he was called upon more and more frequently for advice by fellow priests and dignitaries of the church. Whether or not he was still haunted by his old longing to go to a monastery, where he might live out his life in quiet, solitude, and prayer, no one knew. He no longer spoke of it. The long, strength-consuming years, and now a racking cough, which had held on for a very long time, had made the curie almost voiceless. Yet two hundred, three hundred, four hundred people a day flocked to ours to hear Father Vianney speak, to go to confession to him, to get his advice and his fighting heart would not let go while people needed him. One day in 1858, a priest asked him a question. 
Father, if God gave you the choice between going to heaven at once or going on working as you do for the conversion of sinners, which would you choose? I'd stay. But in heaven the saints are so happy. No more troubles, no more temptations. Yes, the saints are happy enough, said the curie slowly. Then his deep-set eyes began to twinkle. But they're capitalists. They worked well, of course, because God punishes idleness and only rewards hard work. God loves them and hears when they intercede for us, but they can no longer win souls for him by labor and suffering as we can. The priest considered that for a moment. Well, if God were to leave you here below until the end of the world, you'd have all the time you wanted in front of you. Tell me, would you still get up so early? The curie smiled. Yes, indeed. I'm not afraid of a little tiredness. I should still be the happiest of priests if it weren't for the thought that I shall have to answer for my priestly responsibilities before the judgment seat of God. The old man's eyes filled with tears. He had such a high regard for the priesthood, its privileges and duties, and was so sure he was failing in his task. For almost forty years now he had worked up to eighteen hours a day. Two or three ounces of food daily had been his nourishment. Yet he felt that there was so much more to be done so much greater effort to be expended, so much fiercer a fight for souls to be waged. In August of 1858, a priest from a neighboring town called on Father Vianney. Apologizing for his disheveled appearance, the visitor told how he had narrowly escaped injury when his horses shied and threw the carriage into a ditch. St. Anthony never let anything like that happen to him, observed the curie gently. How did he prevent it? asked the astonished priest. He always traveled on foot, explained Father Vianney with a little smile. The abashed visitor hesitated, then went on to the problem which he had come to discuss. As always, Father Vianney told him what he needed to hear, and he rose to go, enlightened and comforted. And may I come back next August, Father, to tell you how matters have progressed? The curie thought for a moment. Then his pain-edged face broke into its ineffably sweet smile. No, Father because I shall die early in August of next year. The sure knowledge that he had but a year to live spurred the curate to even greater efforts. He tried to spend more time with the children of the village who had always been his particular love and care. They flocked around him, touching his clothing, clinging to his fingers, loving him. Even the most boisterous of the lads grew soft-spoken and gentle in manners when they drew near him. They seemed to sense that the beloved, frail old man would not be with them much longer. But physically frail though he might be, his mind and soul were still indomitable. He was still God's warrior, fighting to help sinners save themselves. One evening, when Father Vianney was preparing to leave after a long day in the confessional, a man came into the sacristy. Tall, well-dressed, he was obviously a person of means and of importance. "'Good evening,' said the weary priest. He turned back to the confessional beckoning the man to follow. "'Good evening,' answered the stranger. Then he went on. "'I have not come to go to confession. I have come to reason and argue with you.' The curie paused. "'Oh, my friend, you have made a great mistake. I am not a reasoner or an argufier. But if you are in need of consolation, and I think you are, kneel there.' His finger, thin almost to emaciation, pointed to the prayer to where penitence knelt. Be sure that others have done so before you, the curie went on, and none have been sorry. The man snorted. I have already told you, Father Vianney, that I have not come for confession, and for a very good reason. I do not believe in confession. I do not believe in anything. I have no faith. Oh, I used to have, but I am wiser now. The curie of ours was aghast. No faith. My dear man, how I pity you. You are wiser, you say? Why, a child of eight who has learned his catechism knows more than you do. The man who had come to argue with a simple country priest became angry. He, an important person, in his own mind at any rate, had intended to reason with the curie, to explain to him the stupidity of his beliefs. But the curie was not listening humbly as his would-be instructor felt he should. You say you have no faith, the priest went on. You are wrong. You do. I'll be insistent with you, as I shouldn't have been if you had not spoken so foolishly. Kneel down, and I'll hear your confession. But, Father Vianney, this is ridiculous. You are asking me to act in a comedy with you, and I am no comedian. 
the stranger's voice shook with rage and his eyes were filled with fury as he looked at the frail priest the priest looked back in silence the stranger's eyes dropped kneel there there was a mingled sweetness and authority in the curie's voice seemingly in spite of himself the man fell to his knees he made an unsure and trembling sign of the cross and stumblingly began to accuse himself of his faults the curie of ours gave absolution and went to the rectory where visitors awaited him the stranger went into the church his former arrogance was entirely gone replaced by a strange peace what a man he is he murmured as he slipped into a pew and knelt on the hard foot bench what a man no one ever spoke to me in that way before if he had not taken hold of me in just the way he did who knows when i would have made my confession i might have died without the self-important man without faith bowed his head and wept pastors from nearby villages had for some years past brought their first communion classes to the curie of arts for instruction a duty and privilege which had always delighted father vianney this year it seemed to some of the adults observing him that he was even more eager that his eyes burned more brightly as he watched the boys and girls preparing for the great day of their lives in the spring of eighteen fifty nine an old friend of the curie went to ours and not having seen him for some time past was shocked at the extent to which he had failed i learned that for a long time past he wrote to a friend father vianney had seemed to sustain by the breath of life the little thread of voice left to him could be heard only by a very attentive ear all the energy of his life and mind seemed concentrated in his eyes which burned like two brilliant stars in their deep recesses betokening strength and a weakness life and death the old warrior knew that his fighting days were drawing to a close that it would soon be time for him to leave the church militant but as long as he remained on earth he would not retire from the lists the world was in a disturbed condition in the united states the question of slavery was increasingly agitating the people france was once again at war with austria in june of eighteen fifty nine a heat wave began spreading from california to mid europe sapping the strength of healthy people ending the lives of those already ill all june it continued and on into july ours was damp and stifling but the pilgrims continued to come hundreds each day and the curie continued to hear confessions from one o'clock in the morning through the cruel heat of an unbelievably long day he remained at his post it was a slow and painful martyrdom the sharp cough which had plagued him for twenty-five years was more tearing and incessant than ever several times he fainted but always swore to secrecy any one who might have been near when he fell he talked at more frequent intervals of philomena his dear little saint and even admitted to father tolkenir that god had permitted her on occasion to come down from heaven to advise him the heat grew greater and more stifling each morning the sun would go down in an angry-looking mass of flames each morning it arose sullen and burning on the twenty ninth of july the curie put in his usual seventeen-hour day finally he said his night prayers at the shrine of st philomena and returning to his house sank into a chair i can do no more he gasped End of chapter 11 Recording by Maria Therese